Welcome to the Jaron Jarvis channel. I am Jaron Jarvis. Today, I would like to introduce to you, Life on an Outback Cattle Station Murray and the Mokoi. The Screaming Men. Pixie Circles. Old Stone Knees. The Satan Stones. Backpackers at the Billabong. Many thanks to those who have asked me about the drought, but we're actually doing okay out here all things considered. It's getting a bit tougher to find fresh feed, and we're having to put in longer hours, but we've still got plenty of water in the dams and the hay sheds are full. I feel for the smaller guys or those who are in drier places, but out here some of our dams are big enough to have yacht races in. We'll be okay. After the story of our brief encounter with a mock koi out in Lucy's, I said I'd be sharing Murray's story. Murray is a fixture on the farm, and he has been ever since I was a kid. I genuinely don't even know how old he is, or what he actually does around here, although I do believe he has some kind of spiritual abilities. He's just Murray, and he might as well be family. A man like Murray has an endless supply of stories, about anything you can imagine. Beyond his own experiences at the farm, he and his family have lived on the land for centuries, passing down all sorts of tales about all sorts of happenings. This tale, though it didn't happen on our property, is the one that chilled me the most, particularly given our own Mokoi problem. As a young child, Murray lived in a community quite a way west of our property. It's fair to say that Murray, although his family did escape much of the worst the Aboriginal people had to endure, was raised in poverty. But at the same time, he will tell you himself that he never really wanted for anything. Coming from a long line of ancestors who lived off the land for millennia, he and his relatives eked out their existence much the same way they always had. I have no idea when any of this took place, but I'd guess Murray must be at least 70 so I'm going to say that it would have been at least 60 years ago. He was living in a tiny village, one of several collections of very basic tin buildings within a 50 km radius or so that formed the basis of a community. During a particularly hot, dry summer, things started going missing. At first it was small things, totems and trinkets. The people didn't think a lot of it. They even blamed ravens because they're notorious for taking anything slightly shiny or interesting if the mood takes them. When the ravens themselves vanished, and things kept disappearing, they blamed one of the children. When one of the children went missing, shit really hit the fan. The missing child, a young boy, wasn't found within a few days. Obviously this was tragic and upsetting, but also confusing for the elders of the community. There were literally no predators out there at the time before dingoes made a comeback and before feral dogs were a problem, and if he had fallen victim to a snake bite or similar they would have found him within a few days. It only got worse, as children in each of the other small family villages went missing over the next few weeks. One from each, nine in total. The elders were terrified, conjuring up ideas of all sorts of monsters. Kids were corralled in buildings with the adults, rituals were performed, the works, one by one, though, remaining children began to fall sick. The illness manifested much like I would imagine many common infections do. The first symptoms were fatigue and irritability, a loss of energy and appetite, and aching in the head, limbs and joints. From there it got a little weirder. The kids lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time, their eyes became roomy and opaque, and their hair began to grey and fall out. One night, Murray was sleeping in a room with six or seven other kids when he awoke with a start. He couldn't say what woke him, just that he felt like he needed to wake up right away. It was dark, but the light of the near full moon and the kerosene lamps on the outside walls filtered through and gave him some visibility. He couldn't work out why he had woken, the flickering shadows all looked reasonably normal. After a moment, though, he noticed one of the shadows was moving. At first he thought it was a trick of the light, but the more he stared the more the shadow moved. It was deliberate, intelligent, picking its way amongst the children before settling over one of the sick. Like a swarm, it seemed to grow, engulfing the child before tightening like a net. Murray almost didn't dare breath as he watched the feeble struggles of the poor child caught within that shadow as it started to crackle with what he could only describe as static electricity. Within a few minutes, it lifted and retreated back towards the corner of the room, 
forming into the shape of a hunched old woman. I know you see me, child. He almost jumped out of his skin at the voice that seemed to reverberate inside his head. It spoke his native language, but it didn't sound human. It was simultaneously sing-song and guttural, somehow, and not an unnatural voice that filled him with dread. You need have no fear of me, young one. I shall feed on your brothers and sisters until they are but dust, but your essence is not mine to take. No, your fate lies with another, and even I don't interfere. With that, the shadowy crone seemed to shrink to a single point, blinking out in an instant. Murray was too scared to move and too scared to sleep, waiting until the morning sun filled the room and banished the shadows before he leapt out of bed and ran to his father. Upon hearing his story, his father paled and scooped him up, hurrying to find the elders. Murray had to recount his terrifying encounter again, drawing gasps and curses from the assembled elders. He was whisked away before the elders could discuss what he had seen, but he heard them say the word Mokhoi and he knew that everyone was in grave danger. I explained, briefly, what Mokhoi are when I told of our own encounter, but there's more to it than that. They are a force of pure evil, from a place completely outside our world, destructive malevolent entities that feed on life itself. Local people call them evil spirits, but they are physical entities that manifest themselves in our world, gaining strength from feeding and becoming more and more powerful. They can only appear in darkness, being from a world where there is no light or good. You could almost say they're demons, if you're looking for a more Christian analog. Only Mokoi are much, much worse. There was a feeling of utter, powerless terror as the day slipped away and night started to fall. This was almost the ultimate boogeyman, and no one knew whether or not the elders had any way of fighting it. When the elders finally emerged, saying they believed they had the solution, there was a collective sigh of relief. Australian indigenous people have a vast array of rituals, spells and ceremonies aimed at different aspects of the world they inhabit. The elders believed that there was a ceremony they could perform that would rob the Mokkoi of the life essence it had already stolen, rendering it powerless and therefore vulnerable. They believed that this would buy them enough time to call a medicine man from a neighboring community to banish the spirit once and for all. As night fell, two of the elders sequestered themselves in the building the children had been sleeping in. They were adorned with the appropriate ceremonial paints for protection and took with them plants and herbs to prevent the Mokhoi from leaving before the ceremony was complete. The rest of the villagers took refuge in another building, warded with symbols to fend off the spirit. It was tense, but most of the kids managed to eat their meal and fall asleep. Murray was not one of them. Eventually, almost everyone had dozed off, and Murray could hear the faint sound of chanting and other vocalizations coming from the other building. He felt something was wrong long before it happened. The tone of the song shifted, becoming more desperate, and then something laughed. It laughed so loudly that it woke several of the folks sleeping around him, a demented laugh of pure and total disdain. One of the elders shouted, and then everything went to shit. From the dormitory building came a scream unlike anything Murray had ever heard, a scream of sheer terror. It was immediately joined by another and that sick laughter boomed out again. Two of the men ran for the door, but they found it could not be opened. They would later say that someone was on the other side, begging for the door to be opened, but the spirit wouldn't allow it. Then came an even worse sound, the two elders, screaming in chorus. Murray said that it was the most terrifying sound he had heard in his entire life, shrieks of torment so agonizing that it must have taken all sanity and left something animalistic behind. There was nothing human left in the sound, as though whatever torture the mock coy had devised for the poor elders had robbed them of anything but the most basic instinct. Those screams went on for almost two hours. Several of the family took up their kids and ran into the night, desperate to get away from whatever unearthly horror was unfolding in that building. Others were simply frozen like lambs, miserable, unable to act. Eventually the screams sputtered and died, and an almost palpable silence fell over the tiny village. As the seconds ticked by, a shadow began to form in the center of the room Murray was in, prompting panic as the Mokoi shifted its attention to the remaining family members. This time, the Mokoi took a different form, one that Murray believed was close to its true appearance. 
tall and lean, the spirit seemed to shift and boil, making detail impossible to see. There was a mouth full of perfect, razor teeth, eyes blacker than anything should reasonably be, and forearms ending in savage claws as long as a hunting knife. An uncle snapped out of his stupor and, for some reason, decided to attack the creature, which decapitated him with nothing more than the flick of a wrist. Murray watched dumbly as the disembodied head dropped to the ground with a soft thump. He should have been terrified. He should have run. But Murray was overcome with a sense of calm that he had no explanation for. A voice filled his head, much like the McCoy had the previous night, but this was different, warm and wise. He did not understand the words, but he found himself repeating them in a voice that wasn't his own. The McCoy immediately tilted its head and fixed with a glare. It seemed to blink out of existence and then blink back directly in front of him, picking him up with a hand so cold it stung his skin. What an interesting development, said the spirit, sounding more amused than anything. I can see why your fate is as it is, little sorcerer. It traced a claw over Murray's cheek as he continued to speak words beyond his own comprehension. Suddenly the McCoy pulled the claw back, as though it had been shocked. Its demeanor changed entirely. I may not be able to kill you, worm, but that does not mean I cannot put an end to this all the same. A clawed hand closed around Murray's throat, and the cold sensation grew into a scorching burn. The voice in his head never wavered, and he felt a strength fill him, combating the pain. Murray's story gets a bit sketchy here, I think partly because he is getting on, and partly because whatever the actual sequence of events was it was all hectic, and he almost felt he was an observer in the whole thing. The McCoy, apparently feeling this strength too, howled and threw him across the room. He crashed through a tin sheet wall, but the words never stopped and he never actually hit the ground. It was like he was hovering. The McCoy let out a shattering roar and was gripped by white light that snaked around it like vines, trapping it in place. The light vines seemed to tighten, and the black spirit thrashed and shrieked in a rage. As they tightened more and more, the McCoy began to shrink and, eventually, it vanished in a blinding flash of white light. When I asked him how he managed all this, Murray absently fingered the burnt scar on his throat and smiled. Who knows? Something helped me, that's for sure. Might have been an ancestor spirit. Might have been the spirit of the land, wanted that evil thing gone. Might have been a lot of things. I never could remember what I said to banish the Mokoi. We burned the village next day, got the hell out of there and eventually wound up out here. I started to train with a medicine man but I didn't feel like it was the place for me. The land out here called to me, and so I turned up and asked your grandfather for a job. Been here ever since. That was all I could get out of him, about the mock coy anyway. Something he said still resonates with me though, the bit about the mock coy not wanting him because he was fated for something else. Murray just shrugged when I asked him about it and said that it was up to the spirits to decide. I couldn't help but wonder what a mock coy, an entity that is essentially personified fear, would worry about so much that it didn't want to muscle in on its territory.